Gabriel Radford, welcome to the show. Thank you. When did you join the TSO? I joined the TSO in 2002 after four years in the Winnipeg Symphony. Tell us a bit about your role uh, in the horn section. The truth is that third horn is actually kind of a solo role, and that dates back a long way because when horns have no valves, so the keys on the horn that make it longer so that you can play in all the keys of that, that we play music in. And so when we had these pairs of horns in different keys, they could only play in that key. So you would want two players in one key, say F major, and two players in another key, say D major. And so if we were in the D major portion of the symphony, then the first horn of the D horns, or in this case, we now call it third horn, would have solos. So in a lot of repertoire, when you hear a horn solo, you may actually find it's the third horn and not the first horn. So you're kind of the stealth soloist in the orchestra. Stealth soloist. In fact, many people in the TSO, members of the TSO, don't know what I just said. And so they actually don't know which solos are third and which are first. And let me be clear, first one has more solos than third. But <laughs> it's in, in some repertoire, it's quite um, frequent. In, in, for instance, Brahms and Dvorak have lots of third horn solos. So how often does it happen that people, you know, after, after performance, go up to uh, Neil DeLand and say, hey, great solo, when it was your solo? You know, it's funny you say that. It happens remarkably often. And we have this running joke. Rather than try to explain the whole thing, he just gives me a sideways look and smiles and says thanks. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's part of our inside comedy in the horn section. That is quite a wacky feature of your role. I have to say, I didn't even know that. You know, it, it happens all the time. And we have a good laugh with our colleagues about it who finally turn around. And after 20 years in the orchestra, they say, I didn't know that that was third horn. So it happens oh all the time. Oh, my gosh. Now, uh, I would love to hear about your personal path to the TSO. How did you end up there? Well, the TSO is my hometown orchestra. It's, it really is in every way a dream job for me. I grew up at Young and Eglinton and went to North Toronto Collegiate. And in grade 12, I was thrilled to get into TSYO, Toronto Symphony Youth Orchestra. And then I did my undergraduate degree at U of T um, with the principal horn of the TSO, Fred Risner. Then I went away to Boston for my master's degree and was training basically to hope to get a job in the TSO. I managed to get a job in the Winnipeg Symphony, which is a wonderful orchestra um, that is a huge asset for the city of Winnipeg. And then when the Toronto Symphony called to offer me a one-year position, I jumped at it and I took it. And then uh, the scariest moment of my life was having to audition for my own job. I'd, I'd been playing the job. And then they, um, because of the rules, they had to announce the audition. So many people came to audition for Third Horn, and somehow I ended up on top. Yeah, somehow, somehow. <laughs> well, it really it does sometimes feel like somehow, because it, it was an immense amount of work, and you never feel like you're good enough. And so the fact that I got the acknowledgement uh, when I came out from behind that screen that my colleagues considered me good enough for the job was, was a really very important day in my life. I bet it was. Now, this is an all-in-the-family affair for you because you're married to the principal oboe, Sarah Jeffrey, and I bet a lot of listeners are wondering how that works because you have kids, right? So they go to school in normal times uh, during the day, and then at night their parents are off uh, performing with the TSO. So how do you guys work that out? Well, first of all, I'll say Sarah and I met in Toronto Symphony Youth Orchestra, and now we play in the TSO together. It's really a dream story. Um, and in terms of having kids, it's meant that we have needed babysitters more than anybody we know. And our kids have had to be resilient, let's face it, uh, from a very young age as little babies. We were very lucky to have the same caregiver until they were almost three years old. So my children are now 9 and 11. And I think it's given them a sense of independence. Um, and, you know, we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to the people that have looked after our children for us in the evenings. In many ways, having a sitting job is actually great for parenting because although we do leave at the evenings, we often are around at the after school time before concerts. So it is difficult in some ways, but it's also wonderful to be able to pick up your kids almost every day at school and then hang out with them until seven when they're getting ready for bed anyway. Now, I know teaching is a big part of your passion. You've actually been awarded the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for your work with the National Youth Orchestra. Uh, what is the most important technique or idea that you want to pass on to your students? You know, it's very easy for us 
to get lost in the craft of what we do, you know, the how to play the horn well. And the emphasis of my teaching, you know, certainly we have to talk about how to play the horn well, but in the end, it must be about the music. And so what makes me passionate about teaching is helping to share my passion for the music and teaching students how to get in touch with themselves in order to interpret these incredible works of art. I often say that you go to an art gallery to look at art, but as a musician, you're asked to actually pick up the paintbrush and paint the, your interpretation of the work. It's a tremendous responsibility to take a phrase written by someone like Brahms and to have the confidence let's just call it confidence, to interpret that music in a way that makes it yours as well as respect the score. Now, I believe that every chair, this is a question I'm asking everyone, I believe every chair in the orchestra has a particular art that the audience and maybe even your colleagues aren't aware of. We already heard a big part of that with the sort of stealth yeah. solo role you play. But what is the secret art of Third Horn? The secret art of Third Horn is making everyone else sound good. Um, the, the role of third horn when it's not those solo moments. The role of third horn is to provide stability right in the center of the section so that when the first horn needs a break, um, because uh, playing the horn is very physical and sometimes it becomes so taxing, you need, you need to rest. If the first horn needs a break, that's when I step up and make sure that I can make them sound good for the solos. And when it comes to intonation, since I'm right in the center of the action there, I'm the one that can hear on both sides of me. So, so my role is really to make the section, and particularly the principal, but the section sound good. By, by really nailing pitch in a certain way, or is it a tone thing, or all of the above? Well, that's a very good question. There are lots of aspects to playing in tune, and what I call a tunable sound is a sound that is full. My role is to make a sound that others can latch on to as the place of, of where the tuning needs to be. Very cool. Gabriel Radford, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. It was great to talk to you.